Hello, welcome to the LaRouche Pack Weekly Report for December the 14th, 2011. I'm John Hofel, and with me in the studio today are Ouyang Ting from the basement, Sky Shields from the basement, and Lyndon LaRouche. So Sky, why don't you lead it off this morning? All right. Um, when I tell you that the discussion today will be a discussion of economic policy, I think that the initial idea that pops into your mind is not going to be an accurate one. Uh, the, the principle, which I think we'll have a chance to tackle today from a number of different angles, is actually one that's going to be close to your heart in a very unique way. I believe that likely all of you as a viewing audience and much of the world today is gripped by a very specific type of wrong thinking. This specific type of wrong thinking is a kind of thinking that's convinced people that it's possible to find a peace with the existing Obama administration. That, what, that the desire is a desire to avoid conflict. And you'll recognize that this is a, a state of mind that's gripped the entire U.S. Congress. People who know full well who the enemy is and that we have an enemy here on our own soil within the White House. People who recognize that the intention of that enemy is to crush everything that this nation has represented. And that that enemy is, has, is a self-proclaimed enemy of human progress and the human species are still instinctively attempting to try and a smooth out, to try and find a to try and find a place of zero tension where they can operate. Now, what is wrong with this? Aside from the fact that this simply won't work, that it's a clear misunderstanding of the character of the enemy that we face, it's also a violation of a very fundamental economic principle, and that's the principle of human creativity. To understand why this is true, we're going to have to come up with a very different definition of creativity than I think most of you are used to. Most people have a very, I think, sort of light, kind of fluffy idea of what creativity is. But to understand what creativity is from an economic standpoint, uh, we're going to have to dig deep into, some, into principles of physical science, <clears throat> deep into principles of, of various, we'll have a chance here today to tackle various social principles, and we'll see their echoes in various other domains of study. But as a, as a quick sketch, I'll give, you the, I'll give you a picture here, that what we're talking about when we're discussing creativity, <clears throat> human creativity, is a process which echoes the creative development of the universe as a whole. You find this expressed in a, a very concise way uh, uh, in various forms of Judeo-Christian philosophy and mythology. The idea that man is made in the living image of the creator. That is, that the, the process that you see manifested in every single human individual on this planet is a reflection of the creative process that governs the universe as a whole. Why is this significant? Because if you take a look at, we can t at any given moment in history, that is any given moment in human history, any given moment in the history of the universe as a whole, the set of phenomena on the planet seem to consist of what you might call a, uh, a, clo a fixed closed logical deductive system. That is to say it's possible to take all of the existing principles all of the existing, all of the existing knowledge, and to form a system that within itself is more or less complete, is more or less consistent, more or less logically and deductively consistent within itself. It is the case, this has been discovered and demonstrated, however, by Lazar Carnot and his work on heat engines, that any closed system, any deductive system, is has inherent in it an element of entropy. By definition, any closed logical system is a reflection of the exact same kinds of processes that you see with, with a heat engine, where you've got a fixed input, you've got a fixed output. So by definition, that sort of a system precludes creativity. Any sort of action taken inside that system is, any action taken within the confines of those systems, is, that system is not a creative action. And when you start to take that system out of the abstract and you apply it to real world scenarios like the one we're in right now, that necessary drive towards entropy within that system represents very potentially, potentially very disastrous consequences. So the question of actual creativity and actual creative act is 
not to be found in any given closed system, any closed set of facts, but somehow in a sequence of these closed systems, a sequence of these, of these, of these facts. Somehow a, passage, a passageway through these systems is necessary. Now, within, from the standpoint of a system, from the standpoint of that, of that system in that moment, that necessary break that necessary pathway out into, an, into a new system will always take the form of a paradox. It'll take the form of an inconsistency from the standpoint of that existing system, necessarily. The way that expresses itself is often in the form of an irony. And we'll say that what will, that recognizing that phenomenon is going to set us on the pathway. If we can zero in on that, we're going to start to be able to understand the physical definition of of an irony, the ontological significance of irony, as opposed to, again, the more simplified concept that I think most people have. This is going to be an irony that's, that's, that's exemplified in the most profound examples of, of classical artistic composition, but is not limited to those examples of classical composition. That it's, it's the fact that, that that classical composition is able to manifest a true principle of the underlying universe that makes it so that makes it so powerful. But now how does that express itself on from an emotional level? The emotional attachment to those to that fixed system, the emotional attachment to those 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 that boundary, the boundary in which you find yourself confined, is expressed in, in various ways. And in a, a proper psychology would treat these expressions as pathological. As pro- I, I would almost say the only definition of pathological and a pathology, which is, you, ex- you see this in, you said the cries from people of, uh, you know, our tradition, but we must respect our tradition. You see it in the idea that, well, we must avoid conflict. We have to avoid tension. All of these things are emotional expressions, but what are they? It's your mind at that moment being governed by an invisible set of rules, an invisible fixed system at that moment. You can know, even without knowing the specific ways that that behavior is going to unfold, you can know for a fact that that will head towards disaster. And this is the exact same instinct that you see in classical Greek tragedy, where you see a process by the very behavior, the, the beliefs inherent in a population lead that population toward collapse. The definition of creativity is the ability to challenge that fixed system, to challenge that set of belief, to drive towards a paradox in that system, and to force any system towards a higher resolution, a necessary higher resolution. Now, right now, we're facing that that both economically and strategically in such a way that the strategic strategic consequences we're facing are a necessary consequence of where we've reached economically that the tolerance, the last several decades of tolerance of uh, free trade economic policy, of a globalized system of monetarism, the idea that monetary value is going to be a substitute for actual physical value, the necessary consequences of this are what we're seeing right now unfolding throughout, throughout the world, but in uh, a very acute way currently in Europe. We're watching the complete collapse of all the structures that have, been, that have been put together over the course of the last several decades, every single one of these. We're at the end of the Euro system. We're at the end of the Eurozone. We're, as we're, if we're looking at the various coups being run in locations, we're realizing that we're possibly at the end of the existence of various countries, various language cultures. We're at, the point where you, we're at a point in history where you're going, you can lose entire cultures, entire nations on the face of this planet. Uh, there's a high likelihood that one of these, if our course is not changed right now, that one of these laws could be the United States. This is very real. This is where we stand now. This is an inevitable, the response, the response to this now from the side of those who would like to try and hold this system together is going to be to the impossibility of holding that system together combined with their manic desire to try and hold it together, is going to force this thing even deeper into an, into a, an impossibility, into a necessary paradox here, which is that on the part of the British who would like to hold this system together, their intention, their passion right now, is a drive towards destroying the only options that we have globally to get ourselves out of the current crisis. And it's expressing itself as their desire through our president to launch a 
uh, thermal global thermonuclear war, most immediately against the uh, Russia and China as enemies, the exact nations that should be our allies in breaking out of the system where we stand right now. But all of this, the this economic meltdown, the threat of war, all of these things are a necessary consequence of attempting to hold on to the system in the form it currently exists. The, the exactly what these members of Congress think they're doing, exactly what many of you think you're doing by attempting to, to maintain a peace, to maintain, to, to, to keep your peace with this current system, to try and keep yourself uh, uh, at some safe point where things simply don't injure you, that desire is exactly the desire which is going to get you killed and which will destroy this, which will re result in the immediate destruction of civilization. So I think the topic for discussion right now is to tackle that more, that mindset, to take it out of, to examine this patho pathology there, but from a much higher physical scientific standpoint, but then also to take that question of irony, this question of, the, of an actual opening in a, in a closed, what seems to be an otherwise closed logical deductive system. Take this question of irony, take this question of human creativity, and to translate that into policy. To say, what would be the necessary policy required to get ourselves out of this current crisis? And we have hints at this in some recent moves by Russia. We have hints of this in recent, the recent moves by Russia towards the Arctic and, and their development. And an analysis of that from the standpoint of a break in this current system will be I think fruitful for many people. We also have hints of this in their offer for collaboration around the, uh, we might say the, um, the, the, the grandchild, the development of your earlier project, the SDI, the SDE, Strategic Defense of the Earth. And what it, central in both of these is the fact that the vision here is reaching towards a necessary state of mankind's destiny and the stars mankind's destiny off of Earth and in the solar system and beyond as a whole. And we'll discuss, I think in the course of today, we'll have a chance to discuss the, the physical economic significance of that, the actual value of that. But it, it should be seen as juxtaposed against every existing instinct that you have right now that's driving you. Well, there are two things to look at here, first of all, is that mankind is inherently creative. And if you look at the history of living processes in the past half billion years, insofar as we have documentation of that, the, all, all living species are creative in the sense that they supersede one another to a higher, going to a higher form of life. So that there's, a, a contrary to the so-called zero growth, the actual successful uh, existence of, of any system, but particularly living systems, is that they tend to go from lower to higher degrees of freedom. In other words, the very idea of zero growth, that very idea is a anti-human and fr frankly satanic view. Mm -hmm. Now, this satanic view has a well-known <coughs> precedent in known history and antecedents in what are not, is not really known history, is, is a record of life, is a record of of certain aspects of society and so forth. But it, we don't really know intimately, subjectively, how the people in these societies actually thought. We know have so, something about the way they thought. We can see their artifacts and things like that. But not we don't see it as a system. The unfortunate thing is that this, the kinds of systems that we know, human systems, which we do know as historical, are all of one type. They are based on the principle of backwardness, the based on the principle of the oligarchical system. So therefore, now the oligarchical system is operating in a system, a system of life, and particularly human life, in which the condition, precondition for existence of life in general, and human life in particular, in this form, is progress. What we have, it, however, is an oligarchical system which considers progress as a threat to its existence as a system. The, the Roman Empire is only typical of that. The Peloponnesian War is an example of this kind of thing. The history of the collapse, so you have this great pyramid in Egypt, but it collapsed, not the pyramid co didn't collapse, it stayed around. This was a very good system, in a sense. The construction was actually magnificent. There were no slaves involved. There were working people, there were craftsmen. 
and they built this giant thing, which as a marker of a great achievement of a great civilization. And yet that civilization collapsed because of the influence of this oligarchical system. The oligarchical system taking over, boom. And the oligarchical system says, we've got to keep the majority of the people stupid, dumb, under control. That's the idea of the system. We've got to maintain our power over them. And so this is what, so therefore you have the idea of uh, uh, the fixed system of growth. We're stuck with, we're stuck with you know, zero growth. And this thing is killing mankind. If you look at the history of, of historical mankind under oligarchical systems. In every case, the system collapsed. The Roman Empire, in its initial form, went into a series of collapses. It had an initial period. That collapsed. It was a secondary period. Then you had the te- general collapse of the Roman Empire in its original form. And you had the Byzantine Empire. It repeated the same process. Then we had the Crusader system, which was actually the Venetian system. The same process. Then we got the British Empire, which was created out of the new Venetian party. You know, based in the Netherlands. The new Venetian party was initially created to destroy France. You know, these were the anti-Dutch wars. But the Dutch were not Dutch. The Dutch were Venetians. They were agents. They were agents of the banking system, the Venetian banking system, which had extended itself into the Netherlands because of the nature of the swamp, swampy area of the Netherlands, and that was used as a way of controlling a population, just the way Venice was built. Up. Actually, the, Holland was developed as the new Venice. Then you had under William of Orange, William of Orange moved in to clean up on the French process to destroy the, the France entirely. And then he became the author of what became the British system. The British system did the same thing. The British system crushed the cultures of Africa. It crushed the cultures of Asia. Yeah? Particularly the case of India is notorious in this sort of thing. Yeah? So always this. Now the, the British Empire is doing what? The British Empire has openly declared from the British monarchy itself not only the, the idea of the zero growth uh, policy, a mass of murder, uh, but also now the policy of actually reducing the human population of the planet from 7 billion people presently to one at a very rapid rate. And the policies that are being injected in Europe and in the United States as well under this crazy president uh, are the same thing, zero growth. So we're now in the oligarchical system. The objective is to preserve the oligarchical system. How do you do that? Kill the greatest number of people. How do you do that? Destroy the culture. Destroy the high technology culture or anything like it. So you see every one of these empires has gone to a certain rise, then a stagnation, and then a collapse. This is not inherent in humanity. This is inherent in the oligarchical system. So that's, that's where the problem lies. So we, therefore, we have a population which says we have a tradition. Oh, boy, tradition. What a wonderful, ugly term. <clears throat> because it always means, generally, going back and turning the clock back to backwardness. Mm-hmm. And right now we're headed toward the point, a very dangerous point, because of the galactic changes in process. We're going into a different part of the arms of the galaxy at this point in our solar system. And therefore, if we gauge this time using nuclear weapons, thermonuclear weapons, which is what the intention is, to bring a reduction in the population, hmm, there may be no mankind afterward. Because we're going through a period which is going to be fairly dangerous to mankind, not inherently so, but inherently if we stagnate, if we, we stick to a fixed culture, we're vulnerable. Because right now, already, we're experiencing weather changes within the bounds of the galaxy, which threaten mankind's ability to continue to live under the kinds of conditions which we're going to meet. If mankind progresses, then we will be able to deal with this problem. But if mankind does not progress, then perhaps the human species is going to be extinct this time around. And that's what the problem is. So you have, you have a people who are saying, 
well, we've got to live in this society. Uh, there are rules in this society. These are the rules. Huh? We have to obey the rules. Well, this is our tradition. Yes, our tradition is to go through these cycles of seeming progress. Then a very powerful group comes to, to, comes to top, con gains control over society under the oligarchical principle, reduces the population or brings the population size under control, lowers the standard of living, lowers the intellectual life, which is the best way of killing people. Mm -hmm. And we're in that again. And there are people now who are tolerating this president and this queen over there. And if these two factors are not removed from power over this planet, we are looking at the threatened extinction of mankind and at least the greatest dark age, the most horrible dark age that mankind has ever known mm -hmm. under civilizational conditions. And that's where it is. So therefore, if you like Obama, you're a suicide case. Mm -hmm. And you ought to kill your neighbor too. And we've got to the point that if Obama were to succeed on his mission assigned to him by the Queen of England, if he were to succeed, you might see the extinction of the human race. You certainly would see the mass death of a lot of people and the degeneration of the condition of human life to something you don't want to think about. It's important to say, you can know this without the predicates. This is not a function of the predicates. Right now, the predicates are glaring. Right now, it is glaring. You can see, I mean, there's no question. You just get statements, clear statements from Russia, clear statements from the U.S., clear warnings from the military establishment in these various locations, the U.S., Israel, Russia, that we are on the, the right now we are on the verge of global thermonuclear war. But again, even without those predicates, what you're saying is this is how the oligarchical system functions. It drives itself towards collapse. That's the definition of it. It is a fixed system. Attaining its goal successfully means the collapse of it and everything connected to it. <clears throat> it's not, there is no way for them to win in the normal sense. If you look at human progress, it's a sequence of these collapses. Uh, the most important thing <laughs> about this whole fact is that if some of us don't fight to stop <clears throat> this, it's going to happen. So the issue is not the pro a prophecy of something going to happen. The issue is it's going to happen unless some of us have the capability and guts to prevent it from happening. And right now that means preventing a war in the Middle East, which will be a thermonuclear war in short order. It, to do that means you've got to get this president out of office. And if you don't get this president out of office, which, you have, which the politicians in question have to have the guts to do, then you get to the next question. The decline of a civilization in all the cases we know of these civilized forms is there is a degeneration of the morals and mind of the population which precedes the collapse of the population. <clears throat> and we now have the fact that people will not fight they will sit there, members of Congress, people of power in the United States, people of power in many parts of the world, will not fight to remove this president from office. And if they will not remove him from office, if they lack the guts and brains and morals to do so, then we're finished. Then the human species as we know it in its present culture is finished, precisely because of these people are corrupted. Now. One of the key things that happened, you had two phases of corruption which are most important in recent history. One is the death of Franklin Roosevelt. And already at that point, the Nazis, which were called the British then, they got the, they got the flag back, you know, uh, did that first. Then we had a, a resuscitation under Eisenhower, who stopped that a little bit. Not totally, but stopped it. That's how we got the space program started, it was under Eisenhower. Uh, then we had the Kennedy, and the enemy killed the Kennedys. It was, a, it was personal also, because he was an opponent of their policy. Their policy was a zero growth program. What has happened since Kennedy was assassinated? Well, the first step was the Indochina War. The prolonged 10 years of an Indochina War was a period of destruction of a generation in the United States and it passed on to the successive generation. We now have a generation in the age group, say, between 15 and, and 25, which are increasingly <coughs> insane. They, they sound intelligent in some cases. Their, their minds are quick, but they're not sane. 
and we're finding this of a bright young kid, so-called, a bright young kid who's got guns and out there and he's out and killed a bunch of people, this kind of thing. The drug traffic is, is actually the same thing. The drug habit is the same thing. So we, we have the degeneration, the moral and intellectual degeneration of our population over these generations, over these three recent three generations. There has been a degeneration of the quality of the human being in the United States and in Europe. So the degeneration of the moral mind and morals of the population precedes catastrophes of this type. It's, it's the mind that goes first. The mind and the morals go first. I remember this, this experience in uh, Berlin. There's a museum there where they have a reconstruction of a, a Greek temple, the Pergamon. And then, so you look at this, you see the columns, you see the, the, uh, you know, the, the courtyard, the steps leading up to it. You, know, you get a, a little bit of a, a taste of the experience of someone living in this, uh, in this city. You walk down into the next room, and there's a, there's a Babylonian gate. There's a gate from, from Babylon. And the effect internally, the experience, is you actually experience this qualitative difference between oligarchy and of, of what oligarchy is, the, the effect on your internal experience. And that's, you know, it's useful to see that in history to make that qualitative <coughs> distinction. And today... I think it's important, especially with a generation which has no real efficient connect connection to this better uh, strain in American history. I mean, we've essentially been cut off from any active experience of this, that we've got indications, we've got uh, sort of uh, places to look to see where, for example, in, in the Arctic or... Um, in space policy, what Russia and China are doing with space policy, but then taking it further and saying what the possibilities are with the United States in cooperation with those types of developments. You have to, it seems like you have to build a, an image of something which is qualita- which is real enough that, you, that it's tangible for people, but it is also clear that it can't coexist. It's qualitatively different than what we have right now. It's not, it's not an extrapolation <coughs> from present conditions. And it's the ability to sort of take yourself outside of just your existing experience and be able to sort of put yourself on the stage of history and see that we have a heritage that's actually got to have a new expression. We've got to actually develop the new ex- expression of this of <coughs> heritage. And, and you pointed out that, you know, it's, it's the, the greatest advances in European culture is that heritage for mankind now? The irony is that Europe is collapsing. It, it's not capable of maintaining that heritage. What you do have is the possibility to revive the, that strain, make it universal mm-hmm. with places like China, with the, the growing uh, economies in Asia. But it's only going to be through a cooperation. It's only going to be through that cooperation between the United States, right. Europe, and Asia with Russia playing this key sort of mediating role. In it, you can see, I mean, we've got the possibility for the Arctic region to be the region of a renaissance. Mm -hmm. It requires really changing the image people have, because you say Arctic and you get, you know, either this image of cold, desolation, and glaciers, et cetera, or you get the silly environmentalist thing of polar bears. But if instead you take take a look at what we're talking about, the region there, quick glance, take a look for us in the United States, Look, take a look at what Alaska becomes under Nawapa. Under Nawapa project, take a look at the level. I think people, it takes a lot to really get through your head the level of development we're talking about bringing to this state. The number, the sheer number of dams. This is going to form, Alaska is going to form the center of the whole, of the catchment region for Nawapa as a project. We're going to have this massive water collection to prevent all this runoff, freshwater runoff into the, uh, into the oceans up there. The kind of maintenance that you're talking about there, you're talking about some of the, the most advanced technology ever built in the history of the United States, some of the densest infrastructure mm-hmm. ever built, brought to what is currently one of the most backward regions economically, develop, uh, development-wise, in, 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 our, in the United States. You're going to make that, that alone would be enough to make that a major center. 
But then you combine that with the obvious next steps that you're going to take that with that uh, technological basis, that infrastructural basis, you've got the ability immediately to construct the Bering Strait crossing, which is already in discussion, already in discussion right now. We've had a number of conferences on this. Russia, if the United States, if we were to dump Obama and to change our strategy, Russia would immediately be in collaboration with us on this. They're already committed to developing their Far East. They're building some of the major routes, uh, like the Baikal, rebuilding the, the Baikal Amur main line around the development of their of Vostochny Cosmodrome. The major lines that would already be connecting up to the Bering Strait line, they're building this as though this were uh, uh, necessity. Well, why don't you emphasize what you're really saying? You're saying something which is, again, the creative side. What's the answer to this? What, what does this demonstrate? It demonstrates a very simple principle. What we've got out there, we've got a solar system. Right? What's the, tar the target? Well, with going on the moon is, is not really that big a deal. Mm -hmm. It's something we have to do. But it's only a stepping stone to something. What's the policy? The moon is a necessary part of the policy. But what is the policy itself? Well, the policy is defined by Mars. Yes. Right? Now, What's Mars in terms of human habitation now, by our standards of technology today? Huh? What, is mm -hmm. it? what is this telling us? This is saying that we have a human species which has now reached 7 billion people in population. Now, obviously, we're going to go on toward 14 and 15 billion people, huh? unless we okay. don't get rid of Obama. Mm -hmm. uh, what does that mean? That does mean that there is a limit on which, uh, the extent to which the human species can extend its domain within Earth. Ah, but what about the solar system? Well, there are problems there. The first step of the problem is the moon, is the moon landing. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not really the, the great future. That's a necessary step to you know, extraterrestrial life. But we're going into an extraterrestrial system. And we're looking at the Arctic as a, a precursor of going into the, those kinds of areas right. of Earth right. is a precursor of a change in the nature of life, mm -hmm. human life. Mm -hmm. We now realize that to progress, and this is not simply to have more space for mankind, for the human species to become powerful enough to defend itself of against galactic dangers, for example. Therefore, the human population must extend its activities actively, both by instruments which it sends around the universe uh, and other means to, to create the higher conditions of life for mankind. So therefore, we're going to inhabit Mars. But what does that mean? What does that mean in terms of the kind of technology required to do that as a, in a meaningful process? We're not necessarily always going to depend on planets. Hmm? We can create synthetic equivalents of planets. Look at the order of magnitude of increase of energy flux density in periods of progress of mankind. What we've developed in technologies. So our, our, our intention is the, the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And that's a pretty big trip and that's a pretty lot, lot of territory. A lot of moons and a lot of suns and so mm -hmm. forth all out there waiting for you. Hmm? So the natural destiny of mankind is in somewhere in the universe. Right. We have a mission. The mission is probably expressed by, by what? By our creativity, because only mankind has creativity. No animal has creativity. Mm -hmm. They have innovation. They don't have, they don't have creativity. Most people in the United States today have no creativity. What they call creativity is not creativity. It's an abomination to use the name of creativity for what they have. It's innovation, it's not creativity. But the nature of man is creativity. And it's very little promoted in the world today. Hmm? It, what's promoted is imitations, constructions, crafting. But actually, an innov a fundamental principle innovation <coughs> is a very rare commitment. Mm -hmm. But the message is that if mankind is going to survive as a species, mankind must find its true destiny. And its true destiny is not accommodating itself to a circumstance on Earth. Mankind's true destiny is doing something in the universe. 
right? which means first extending our ability to develop things in the solar system. And we, if you think of the orders of magnitude in terms of units of power that mankind has already obtained, it means that the, therefore the increase of the power of mankind, which can be expressed in all kinds of units, the increase of that by orders of magnitude is the, is the nature and destiny of mankind. We're the only creature we know of which is actually creative. No other creature we know of is willfully creative. Only mankind. And the problem with mankind is very few people are actually willfully creative. They're trying to imitate at best or steal or cheat, mm -hmm. something like that. Call it the Steve Jobs phenomenon. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So the point is there's a message here, which is a message beyond science in the ordinary sense. The message is there's a principle to the existence of mankind. It's a unique principle. It is human creativity. Is that unique principle. The principle is in the universe already, but mankind is unique in this. Therefore, in the nat nature of our relationship to the universe, including immediately our immediate environment and what the environment of Earth and around it, um, our destiny, the meaning of our existence, the purpose of our existence, the morality of our existence, is to express the power of willful creativity which insofar as we know today, we are the only species that is capable of willful, actual creativity. That is our nature. That, therefore, is our destiny. Right. You said there's no, way, there's no way out without establishing that as the basis of culture. Yeah. As you said right now, you got, I mean, go back to these, the, the kids, the shooting, the killing right now. Everybody's trying to figure out what kind of therapy to give the kids, what kind of uh, movies to change that they're watching. But this is, again, the same thing. If they don't take this extra step, if you don't change culture in this way, where this is a sense, there's nothing you're going to do for these kids. There's same, nothing else. Same point that it was raised, we raised the other way. What's wrong with these kids? The lack of classical culture. Mm -hmm. What you have is a bunch of young, a group of young kids among all these people, say 14, 15 to 20, 25 area, which you're getting up today. They seem to be very clever. Their, their brains work, they're, they're able to innovate cleverly, not creatively, but innovation. Um, they seem smart. But then you look at something and you realize that the cult, the, what's their culture, their, their cultural proclivities? Because they lack classical culture, and because they're in a society which is not organized around classical culture, that is, they don't even have to respond to it, yeah. um, they therefore are clinically morally insane. And you find more and more of them who sound very bright. They seem to be quick-minded, but they don't have any insight. Right. They don't even know what life is about. They are totally amoral to the point of being totally immoral. They are the most, the most greatest danger to life in the United States today is these kids. They're the ones. We've seen it in the killings before. The mass killings. That's, that episode passed through, but that episode is not gone. It's waiting for a new phase. Yeah. And the problem is, now what people think of as creativity, because what happened to this society was the destruction of classical artistic culture. Yeah. What that did, it produced a lack of actual human qualities of mind among people who got into popular culture. Popular culture is the thing which is the chief source of the destruction of the, of the mentality and morals and sanity of our young people today. No jobs, no meaningful work, get money, well, nothing. Then look at their mind. What's their entertainment? Listen to their entertainment. Hmm? It's clever. But it's insane. You're getting a, a generation, a whole generation is becoming a generation of madmen, dangerous madmen. Mm -hmm. And people feel that outside there. So the, the question is not only the fact that we need the physical scientific benefits, which defines man's destiny. We also need a cultural conception, which is associated with what we used to call classical culture. Right. 
actually classical culture. Yeah, not superficially classical, because you get these neocons who claim, oh, they like Beethoven, they like Shakespeare, they like, they'll claim they like the Greeks. But what they're doing, they're, there's a way the, they like the trappings of classical culture. And they're sort of, they're a counter gang that's designed to destroy that, where really what you discuss with this, this drive towards the frontier, this recognition of human creativity is fundamental, that's the basis of real classical well, culture. It reminds me of, in the course of the 18th century, there was a case in, in England of a church which was taken over by a certain cult. Um, and they had a baboon with whom they had some kind of sexual practices in this church. And everything was fine until the day that the baboon broke out and got loose in the village and it was wearing a woman's dress. <laughs> and so this, this shut down that church. Now, if you want to think about that example, that's what we're getting, that kind of effect as we're getting today. That's what the rock music cult is pretty much the same thing. One baboon in the cult, and you'd probably would elect him as God, you know, mm -hmm. th th this sort of thing. But this is the problem. We don't, we don't have a culture, a human culture. We have a dehumanized culture, right. just like this, this thing in the 18th century cult they had there with a baboon coming, tearing out of this, escaping from the church with his women's dress torn. <laughs> Gives you an idea of what was going on. No, but, but that's the process. We're getting that kind of thing. We're getting these like young baboons. Yeah, that's nice. I'd like to go back to what you were bringing up. It, it struck me uh, thinking about these increases, these necessary increases in energy flux density. The platform <coughs> conception that you've developed over the last year or so. Uh, for economics, which includes not just the applied technology, but implicitly the cultural level, uh, I think can really only be understood from the standpoint of solar system development. I mean, one, one example of that would be to say if we had actually completed the nuclear uh, renaissance, if we'd actually completed the nuclear platform, the fission-based platform, that would include the moon because mm -hmm. nuclear rockets would be the most efficient means for you know, one day travel to and from the moon, for setting up power sources and mining and so mm. forth. You think about Mars, that implies a fusion platform. You're not gonna, that's not gonna be a chemical-based you know, propulsion, yeah. but also the densities that you require for s sustaining environments at that level is fusion. But each of those is not just, it takes it out of the debate about energy policy. Really what those are are markers of a certain total level and total conception for your society. And it really only makes sense from the standpoint of, of the solar system. And if, and if that becomes the basis of your economic metrics, it is also the way in which you can define the kind of uh, cultural standards that you want. I mean, it's, it's what Kraft Erika, you know, the famous space visionary, one of the early space pioneers from Germany, defined as three-dimensional civilization. Because I said, he said, once you get off the Earth, not just physically getting off the Earth, but actually uh, placing the identity of the development of mankind in this broader environment, it fundamentally changes what the definition of civilization is. I mean, for one thing, it immediately severs, uh, it severs you from all of these petty conflicts, these petty manipulated conflicts, geopolitical conflicts on Earth. But it also, what it does is it puts you in a position where the basis for your existence has to be fundamental, not just innovations, but fundamental breakthroughs mm -hmm. in the way that you, you, you uh, uh, manage your environment, develop the environment. And it's the process of pushing for the fundamental breakthroughs, which is the thing that sustains, for example, the young people in your society to have any sense of a future. Well, the problem is you've got to add one thing here. With the great revolution, which occurred in the... At, beginning at the end of the 18th century, the 19th century, rather, uh, that revolution was, first of all, do a nuclear fission, the first development in that direction. Then we went to thermonuclear fusion, and now we're matter matter antimatter reactions. Now, if you take the differences in order of magnitude of energy flux density and compare the, that with, the, with today's energy flux density of production, you see that we are already moving in the direction 
of having a, an end reflux density in the future, one that's coming up now with some, uh, thermonuclear, which is the basis for this warfare right now, a thermonuclear war a fusion, right? and actually going to matter antimatter, which we're experimenting with now, the, uh, how to do that. This means that these orders of magnitude, going from the chemical react explosion level to the f fission level, to the thermonuclear fusion level, to the matter atom matter ray. These are leaps and orders of magnitude of energy flux density. This, these changes in energy flux density of the environment, of a controllable environment, define our ability to progress into the solar system already. And we're now looking at things beyond that. The other thing which is I'm working on, which is key, is our conception of what human flesh is, is a little bit weird. Because we think in terms of what we consider the chemical form of life. We think in terms of the way the mind works generally. The mind doesn't work properly. And it's not the problem of the mind. It's the problem of the way we've been trained ourselves to use the mind. We think about sense perception. We don't think about power. And the, all living processes function in terms of power. It autos the magnitude of power. Mm -hmm. and it, cre human creativity is a, is a matter of power. And we don't think about the human mind. We think about the flesh side of the human mind. We don't think about what the human mind can do. And so, therefore, if you look at this, this correlation between what the human mind really is, which is what I'm concentrating on heavily, because this is where the breakthrough is needed, and then compare that with the orders of magnitude of power sources in terms of fission, fusion, uh, and matter and matter reaction, now you see a multiplier factor which shows you the physical possibility of man's developing habitats in, within the solar system, or functioning habitats. Mm -hmm. And mankind has got to think in terms of not being some kind of an animal, with a talking animal, but thinking of being a, a creature which has an efficient role in the universe, in the larger universe. That's our natural and required destiny. And these these people are trying to hold us back. It's true. I mean, what you what you you pointed out uh, about looking at the you know at least the last five hundred million years of the development of life. The there's a qualitative process of a required increase in energy flux density of the system as a whole. So we say of the biosphere as a whole. The biosphere is a set of relationships. It's not in in that progression. There's no um, sacred form. You know, there's no yeah. sacred a kind of biological form. It's that, pro it's that progression of those relationships. I think, so you can, add, you can say the same thing when you look at human society. There's no, there's what, it, continuing that, proce pro uh, that process, advancing it, is not limited to some specific form either of human so society or even of the human organism. Mm -hmm. If you, if you project it far enough mm -hmm. in, into the future, you say that, that human evolution has got to have a, a, a qualitative form that... We already make that mistake now. We already have a form different than what we think we see. Mm -hmm. we, we, our functional form, the creative powers of mankind, are completely different. They're not based on what biology teaches us. It has nothing to do with biology the way it's understood. Mm -hmm. The human brain is not the source of human intelligence. It's the human mind. The brain is a tool used by the human mind. But we believe in what we see. We believe in what we can touch and see by our standard. We don't consider the fact that there's a process going on of a much higher order, which is actually the function of the human mind. And the function of the human mind is, can, be, can be defined precisely. But it cannot be defined by the ordinary biological terms of mind. And so, effects can be felt as the most serious, as the most extreme effects, both for good and for bad. Show me creativity in a biological system. Show me human creativity in a biological system, in the human brain system. Creativity as such does not exist. No animal has creativity. They have only biological development. Only the human being, is, of all creatures we know, has the voluntary capability of transforming the functional nature of a human being. This change in the functional nature of the human being is located in the concept of mind, not the brain. The brain is a tool used by the mind. It's a necessary tool used by the mind. 
but is not the location of the mind. Mm -hmm. And it's precisely that problem of failing to distinguish the brain from the mind. The, the mind is the, el is the essential element. Mm -hmm. The brain is a necessary tool of the mind. Mm -hmm. uh, creativity is in the universe. Mm -hmm. True human cre creativity is in the universe. It's expressed by the function of the brain, the mind, and so forth in the individual. But we, we, we don't, are not in a society which is concerned anymore with creativity. Creativity was something with the great artists, but the classical art, classical art has been banned. What's called <coughs> art today or entertainment is not creative at all. It's garbage or garbage off huh? <laughs> in the case of the Russian case. Huh? So the, the, our nature is, is of a higher order than we think because we like to use these terms that are popular terms, and when you talk about functions, the functions that, on which we depend for the human success of hum humanity requires us to think in terms that we don't think of in terms of simple biological explanations. If we think about the biological process as reflection of a necessary tool for these things, that's one thing. But the, actually, creativity is on a higher order of magnitude. But the problem you're in a society which does not, it's a Galagaka model. You have only a handful, relative handful of people, and, and right. this is only at the richest periods, where you have surges where mind, like classical poetry, classical music, cl classical science, right. Uh, right. these periods you have a, an increase in the ratio of numbers right. in, of people who are creative. But most of society is not creative. Right. And society today is less creative than when I was growing up. If much less creative. The power of creativity is lost. People use more gadgets. They're using gadgets which are based on the designs of the technology yeah, which was right. designed some time ago. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. we're, we're borrowing from the past now. Mm -hmm. So the problem here, I think, the psychological problem, is man has a degenerated conception of what mankind is. Mm -hmm. Therefore, we set our targets, our goals of human performance, too low. Yeah. We set them in the terms of a fixed society. We, we say the dumb guy who can't understand, we've got to be nice to him mm -hmm. because you've got, you've got to respect him. He wants to be dumb, but you've got to respect him. When it is that very respect for this guy, if it's made general, mm -hmm. you're destroying the, f the future of the human race, mm -hmm. the future expectation of the human race. It's the creative process in society. That's why we want to have children educated, not to make them make money, Mm -hmm. They got more money. We want the children educated because we want human beings to be developed if to do what human beings are supposed to do. Human beings are not rabbits, <laughs> though sometimes they try to breed like them. Right? But, but human beings actually have creative powers that no, no animal life has. Mm -hmm. Therefore, the meaning of human life is creativity. And again, if you have a renaissance, that's got to be what the... The core ideal of that Renaissance has to be that. It's not possible to move out of the, the motion into the Arctic, is what you're saying, has got to have, it's got to be clear in the minds of everybody who goes and every child you bring up that the trajectory is out off the confines of the planet and that the sense of identity is this actual human sense of identity. Take the interviews with the astronauts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that I, gives you. To take, and, and take mm -hmm. uh, people who do sim similar kinds of things, mm -hmm. so analogous. Mm -hmm. yeah. Isn't that the true human being? Right. Isn't that what? Isn't that an example mm -hmm. of what the true human being must wants to be? Mm -hmm. Isn't anybody who doesn't have that aren't they being cheated of something which is their birthright by virtue of being human? Mm -hmm. We we cause people to to destroy and deny themselves the very thing that makes their life meaningful. And what's the worst misery in life today? That life is meaningless. That people go through habits. And they use these hope habits, which we call entertainment mm -hmm. or other forms of gratification. We amuse ourselves with gratification instead of thinking. We amuse ourselves in this way rather than creating something, rather than going to a higher state of con existence of life than we had before. Mm -hmm. And you look at the greatest scientific minds, the greatest creative minds that in, we know in history. Classical art, science, all is the same thing. What inspires those who lead man from a lower condition of life to a higher one? It's exactly that. It's the, humanist, it's the humanist intention. 
We cannot be satisfied unless we are contributing to the humanist intention for man to be, realize what man's potential can be. This is true in art. It is true in science. And what happens, we accommodate ourselves to popular opinion, which is self-destructive opinion. It's trying to get by, get by as you are, to have a sense of pleasure, but to have no meaning to your life. You miss the people who die. But was the, what was the tragedy in that death? They didn't realize what they could have done as potential. When you look at, you look at poor people, the thing you get, the poor destitute people, you know what they could have been had they been given the opportunity right. to do better. And it's, it's love of mankind it expressed in those kinds of terms that we have an obligation to get something done to make a useful step for the future of mankind. And we just don't think in those terms. That's why I'm doing this particular kind of project I'm working on now, is exactly that. The understanding of what is the significance, what is the meaning of the existence of mankind? What is it that makes religions confused? Because they, they talk about the human soul, but they don't know what it is, and they don't, they don't understand it. They don't understand that there's, we have a capability which we we're supposed to use. And instead, we go for these cheap shot effects, firecrackers on, on Sunday. And what we're touching here is the, the, we get to the point where we realize that what we need is to have get out of the way we think today. Think of mankind as what mankind is in terms of what mankind's destiny implicitly is. And mankind's destiny is to be creative and to undertake missions on Earth, in the solar system, and beyond, which are conform with man's capacity, with man's potentiality. So that every generation should mean something contributed by that generation, which is more than the previous generation had accomplished. And each individual should aspire to be part of the process of moving that process along the level. So generation to generation to generation. We used to think that way mm -hmm. in rather simplistic terms, but we thought that way. That was the American frontier spirit. Exactly. People identified as American was that sense. And that was it, the principle underlying it. Now they're showing their back ass. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> was, no, that, that's the issue. You, you, in order to deal with some things which seem like practical problems, you have to deal with practically. The fact is, what's this all about? It's not about these practical things as such. It's about the fact that mankind must be mankind. That human creativity must be the purpose of human existence. Mm -hmm. That each generation must contribute something to the next generation, which is better than before. Mm -hmm. And it's not to try to make everybody like everybody. It's to give everyone the sense that they are contributing to a step of progress of the human species in a proper mission for humanity. Right. That's the, that's the only thing that's really satisfying. Right. At the, you know, at the end of the day, as, as I said, what's really important at the end of the day? That's what's important. Is the human species an important thing in the universe? And is it doing that which makes it important? It's like this Arctic thing. The Arctic thing is a sign, in a sense. Mm -hmm. Mankind is on its way into the, into the solar system. Yeah. And let's to figure out how many generations it's going to take to get Mars under control. That's beautiful. Yeah. Well, this ugly stuff all the time. Well, every form of life is advancing the progress of the universe. From the bacteria that they don't have, bacteria has no idea, doesn't know what it's mm -hmm. doing. Insects, they don't have any clue. Plants, mammals, but humanity, we have a clue. We can advance this. You know, so we need to throw out this whole this synthetic religion known as environmentalism and, and move forward. We have to have the guts to see that what the truth of mankind is. And that's what most people fail to do. I, the conception of mankind is, is what do I like? What makes me feel good? It's, it's not what... What do I accomplish with my life? What makes my life important? Mm -hmm. And people
people who don't have a sense of that don't have a mooring in life. Therefore, they have no commitment. They have no, no solid commitment to doing good because they, they give it up easily because it's, it's only a fantasy. It's like a toy. It's like a, a gift. It's like ice cream or something like that. That's all. And you can give it up, you know. It doesn't mean anything. You can still be human. But creativity, you do that, it's ice cream, so give it up. Okay. All right. Well, that'll wrap it up for this week. We'll see you next week. Thank you.